Welcome to episode two of this read-along book club of Ted Chang's Stories of Your Life. What I'm gonna do, there's going to be probably a wardrobe change, probably a little bit of a lighting change, because the last video I did, I was exhausted sitting down for an hour, going over this story, giving my thoughts. You can see that I was drifting. So I'm gonna record these separately to hopefully have a little bit more energy for you, because I know that can be quite boring unless you're watching my videos to fall asleep, in which case, I'm okay with that too. Before I begin, if you like what I'm doing here, give this video a like so more people can discover it. Also consider subscribing if you aren't already. If you are a lover of storytelling like I am, I much appreciate your help in growing this channel. So the first story in this section is Division by Zero. And I said this in another video, and I think I said it on the Discord as well, but it seems as if Ted Chang is taking a scientific concept in every single one of these stories, more or less, and then asking what if uh, by taking that concept and kind of blending it with the human condition, right? Merging it with humanity in some way to make us feel. So it is not merely a cold law of physics or mathematics or whatever it may be, but what happens when we bring humanity into it? Division by Zero is definitely uh, the best example so far in this collection. I have a feeling that uh, Story of Your Life will, will fit into that category even better perhaps because of its notoriety but i would say so far this is probably my favorite story it's the only story so far that i've actually connected with characters in and that is important to me as a reader so i was really excited to get into this uh, we start with character we end with character the ending itself is a little bit strange but i will talk more about that once we get through the text so let us begin this ride of division by zero Another thing Ted Chang is doing, at least I think in the Tower of Babylon as well as here, he's kind of just starting, and I said it was weird to start a story with something like this, but here it is very clear that he is trying to communicate the foundation for what the story is. So I'll, I'll read it very quickly. Dividing a number by zero doesn't produce an infinitely large number as an answer. The reason is that division is defined as the inverse of multiplication. Sure. If you divide by zero and then multiply by zero, you should regain the number you started with. However, Multiplying infinity by zero produces only zero, not any other number. There is nothing which can be multiplied by zero to produce a non-zero result. Therefore, the result of division by zero is literally undefined. So I'm not a math guy, if you couldn't tell already, uh, but it is definitely something to ponder. There's some interesting things being said in that paragraph, but let us begin with the story itself to see how all this plays out. Renee was looking out the window when Mrs. Rivas approached. Ligamic Leaving after only a week? Hardly a real stay at all. Lord knows I won't be leaving for a long time. Renee forced a polite smile. I'm sure it won't be long for you. Mrs. Rivas was the manipulator in the ward, so this is when we find out she is in a crazy house. Ha! They'd wish I'd leave. You know what kind of liability they face if you die while you're on status? And then a nurse calls down the hall. Your husband's here. Renee gave Mrs. Rivas another polite smile and left. Now we are in Carl's POV. And one thing that is interesting that starts to reveal itself when we get to this, this crazy equation stuff, I guess it's not super crazy, but how one equals two, we're gonna see uh, perspective shifts in the scene. So one B and one A. So one A, I believe is always Renee and one B is always Carl. So Carl signed his name yet another time. And finally the nurses took away the forms for processing. It brought Renee to be admitted. Yes, she's a professor of mathematics. You can find her in who's who. No, I'm in biology. This is when we find out he's a biologist. No, I tried jumping. No, Renee and I didn't know each other then. Now that she has demonstrated she is competent, uh, they are ready to release her into an outpatient treatment program. I really like this uh, back and forth of him answering questions, how we're only getting one side. We're not necessarily getting the question, but we can infer it from what his responses are. I think that's a really interesting way to put you really into the scene, as opposed to having all of that content, which brings us to scene two. There is a well-known proof that demonstrates that one equals two. This is where everything kind of falls apart. And, and I think not, not for me, <laughs> I mean, in the story for the characters, because this is when we are defining essentially what is driving Renee mad. So it begins with some def definitions. Let A equal one, let B equal one. It ends with the conclusion A equals two A, which is interesting considering our chapter headings or our scene headings. That is one equals two hidden inconspicuously in the middle is a division by zero. And permitting division by zero allows one to prove not only that one and two are equal, but that any two numbers at all, real or imaginary, rational or irrational, are equal. Interesting concept, and I, and I really like the fact that he's injecting that into uh, the development of these characters. Which brings us to A. As soon as she and Carl got home, Renee went to the desk in her study and began turning all the papers face down. She considered burning these pages. 
She remembered being on suicide status. She was no manipulator like Mrs. Rivas, but it really was easy. Simply say, I realize I'm not well yet, but I do feel better and you'd be considered almost ready for release. Carl watched Renee from the doorway for a moment. He remembered the day, fully two decades past, when he himself had been released. So we also know that Carl has been committed as well. So this is quite um, an interesting couple, to say the least. I'm sure it's going to be a recipe for disaster. And well, I think you know the answer to that question if you've read the story so far. He had come to visit every day, even though she refused to see him at first. But yet, despite all his efforts, he felt no more than a sense of duty toward her. In the Principa Mathematica, Bertrand Russell and Alfred Whitehead attempted to give a rigorous foundation to mathematics using formal logic as their basis. And by page 362, they had established enough to prove one plus one equals two. So again, we have these foundational preludes, one might say, um, before each of these sections, almost all of these sections, and it's, it's building and building and building, kind of running in parallel to the narrative. As a child of seven, while investigating the house of a relative, Renee had been spellbound and discovering the perfect squares and the smooth marble tiles on the floor. She had almost shivered at their precision. So you can see she's really fixating on perfection, on symmetry, on mathematical things. Uh, her doctoral dissertation at 23, a series of acclaimed papers, she had never paid any of it much attention. What she did pay attention to was that same sense of rightness possessed by every theorem she learned. And this is, again, is building on what is going to drive her mad, the fact that all of her logic, all of the rules that govern her, her world essentially fall apart at the end. Carl felt that the person he was today was born after his attempt when he met Laura. Through knowing her, Carl had learned about empathy and he was remade. Laura had moved on after getting her own master's degree. And he wondered, who had she been with over this course of time? He wondered whom else she had loved. In the early 19th century, mathematicians began exploring geometries that differed from Euclidean geometry. By the end of the 19th century, the best that was achieved was a proof that Euclidean geometry was consistent as long as arithmetic was consistent, which we're going to find out it's possibly not. At the time, when it all began, Renee had thought it little more than an, than an annoyance. She had walked down the hall and knocked on the open door of Peter Fabrici's office. You remember what I was telling you about a couple of weeks back, about the formalism I was developing? Well, a few days ago, I started coming up with really ridiculous conclusions, and now my formalism is contradicting itself. Could you take a look at it? You're just going to come in this afternoon and tell me you found the problem. Assuming that she just needs to have some time away with it, you know, have a fresh mind after just pouring over it for so long. But um, she is asking for his help, even though he knows she doesn't need it. Carl had met Renee at a party given by a colleague of his own. He had been taken with her face. Hers was a remarkably plain face. Saw her smile twice and frowned once. Carl had been caught by surprise. He could recognize a face that smiled regularly or a face that frowned regularly even if it were online. He was curious to how her face had developed such a close familiarity with so many expressions, yet normally revealed nothing. That's a really interesting observation about faces, especially revealing his character, Carl's character. It took a long time for him to understand Renee, to read her expressions, but it had definitely been worthwhile. Now Carl sat in his easy chair in his study. He has a copy of marine biology cracked open in his lap, and she'd been working all evening with audibly increasing frustration. You kind of give yourself high blood pressure if you keep up like this, Carl jested. Don't patronize me. I wasn't. Thank you. She returned her attention to the bookshelves. Carl left, trying to decipher that glare. At the Second International Congress of Mathematics in 1900, David Hilbert listed what he considered to be the 23 most important unsolved problems of mathematics. Proof of the consistency of arithmetic. What this proof had to guarantee was, in essence, that one could never prove one equals two. Rene had known what Fabrici would say before he opened his mouth. You know that toy for toddlers where you fit blocks with different cross sections into differently shaped slots? Reading your formal system is like watching someone take one block and sliding it in every single hole on the board and making it a perfect fit every time. So you didn't find the error, he shook his head. Rene was no longer in a rut. She had come up with a totally different approach to the question as we predicted, as well as Fabrici predicted. Was Renee just frustrated with her work? Renee was too old to be suffering from the disillusionment of a child prodigy becoming an average adult. Whatever was bothering Renee, it was something he couldn't fathom, and that disturbed him. In 1931, Kurt Gödel demonstrated two theorems. The first one shows an effect that mathematics contains statements that may be true, but are inherently unprovable. His second theorem shows that a claim of the consistency of arithmetic is such a statement. It cannot be proven true by any means using the axioms of arithmetic. That is, arithmetic is a formal system, cannot guarantee that it will not produce 
results such as 1 equals 2. And once again, he had come into her study, being Carl. You want to know what's bothering me? Okay, I'll tell you. She drew a line down the center of the page, dividing it into two columns. At the head of one column, she wrote the numeral 1. And for the other, she wrote two long strings of symbols into successfully shorter strings. And the strings became identical. I don't understand, he said. I've discovered a formalism that lets you equate any number with any other number. That page there proves that one and two are equal. Pick any two numbers you like. I can prove those equal as well. It's a division by zero, right? No. There are no illegal operations, no poorly defined terms, no independent axioms that are implicitly assumed. Nothing. Obviously, one and two aren't the same, but formally they are. The proof's in your hand. But you've got a contradiction here. That's right. Arithmetic as a formal system is inconsistent. Okay, this is when her mind is essentially blown or broken. You can't find your mistake. Is that what you mean? No, you're not listening. You think I'm just frustrated because of something like that? There's no mistake in that proof. You're saying there's something wrong within what's accepted? Exactly. Do you see? I've just disproved most of mathematics. It's all meaningless now. So the language of science, what my uh, teachers always used to say in math was, is absolutely meaningless. Now mathematics has absolutely nothing to do with reality. You just mentioned imaginary numbers. Why is this any worse than what went on with those? Imaginary numbers added something new to mathematics, but my formalism is redefining what's already there. There's no way around it. You can take my word for it. In 1936, Gerhard Genzen pro provided a proof of the consistency of arithmetic, transfinite induction. What Genzen had done was prove the obvious by assuming the doubtful. Callahan had called from Berkeley, but could offer no rescue. He wanted to know about her plans for publication of her formalism, because it did contain an error that neither of them could find others in the mathematics community would surely be able to. Because even if it did contain an error that neither of them could find, others in the mathematics community would surely be able to. But her concentration was gone. That was something that frightened her, the possibility that she was losing her mind. So much of mathematics had no practical application. It existed solely as a formal theory, studied for its intellectual beauty, but that couldn't last. A self-contradictory theory was so pointless that most mathematicians would drop it in disgust. The damned theorem made sense. It just felt right. She understood it, knew why it was true, believed it. Carl smiled when he thought of her birthday. Last summer, they'd been in Scotland on vacation. In one store in Edinburgh, there had been a sweater that Renee had been eyeing but didn't buy. He had ordered it and placed it in her dresser drawer for her to find in the morning. And Carl went into her study. Guess what I got for us? She looked up. What? Reservations for the weekend, a suite at the Biltmore. We can relax and do absolutely nothing. Please stop, Renee said. I know what you're trying to do, Carl. You want us to do something pleasant and distracting to take my mind off this formalism. Come on, come on. You know I've been tempted to take barbiturates. I almost wish I were an idiot so I wouldn't have to think about it. It's not anything I can take my mind off of. You just don't understand. So explain it to me. It's like everything I see is shouting the contradictions at me, she said. I'm equating numbers all the time now, like the classical physicist facing quantum mechanics, as if a theory you've always believed has been superseded, and the new one makes no sense, but somehow all the evidence supports it. No, it's nothing like that at all. This has nothing to do with evidence. It's all a priori. How is that different? It's the difference between my measuring one and two to have the same value and my intuiting it. I can't maintain the concept of distinct quantities in my mind anymore. They all feel the same to me. And he walked out of the room and canceled the reservations. Carl intuited two things in the moments following. It was the realization that because he couldn't understand what had brought her to such an action, he couldn't feel anything for her. The second intuition came to him as he was pounding on the bedroom door, yelling at her inside. He experienced deja vu. He remembered being on the other side of a locked door on the roof of a building, hearing a friend pounding on the door and yelling for him not to do it. And as he stood there outside the bedroom door, he could hear her sobbing on the floor paralyzed with shame, exactly the same as he had been when it was him on the other side. And Hilbert said once, if mathematical thinking is defective, where are we to find truth and certitude? Would her suicide attempt brand her for the rest of her life? Would people henceforth regard her, perhaps unconsciously, as flighty or unstable? Were her colleagues to see her now, would they simply say she's lost the knack? The only persons who would feel it nearly as keenly as she had were those who could actually grasp the contradiction, who could intuit it. Callahan was one of those. She wondered how he was handling it as the days wore on. Renee traced a curly pattern in the dust on an end table. I love that detail. Before she might have 
Idly parameterized, the curve examined some of its characteristics. Now there seemed no point. All of her visualizations simply collapsed. She, like many, had always thought that mathematics did not derive meaning from the universe, but rather imposed some meaning onto the universe. Mathematics was totally independent, but it virtually provided a semantic meaning for those entities, supplying categories and relationships. It didn't describe any intrinsic quality, merely a possible interpretation, but no more. What would she turn to now? Among Carl's friends were a pair of women who were each each other's best friend, Marlene and Anne. Years ago when Marlene had considered suicide, she hadn't turned to Anne for support. She had turned to Carl. Anne had always harbored a bit of envy for what he had shared with Marlene. You wondered what advantage he held. The answer was simple. It was the difference between sympathy and empathy. He had always had a reason to consider compassion as a basic part of his character until now. He had valued that, felt that he was nothing if not empathic, but now he'd run up against something he'd never encountered before and it rendered all his usual instincts null and void. After six years of marriage, he had fallen out of love with her. Renee's intellectual and emotional lives were inextricably linked so that the latter had moved beyond his reach. His reflex reaction of forgiveness cut in, reasoning that you couldn't ask a person to remain supportive through any crisis. To stay would mean accepting a different kind of relationship. What would I do? And his answer had always been, I would say, hypocrite. His leaving Renee was inevitable, but it would be a sin he couldn't forgive. Albert Einstein once said, insofar as the propositions of mathematics give an account of reality, they are not certain. And insofar as they are certain, they do not describe reality. I love this because as her mind is devolving, as their relationship is crumbling, all of these statements from these geniuses, these scientists of the past, are reflecting upon mathematics to relate to what they're going through. And now we see the uh, chapter heading here called 9A equals 9B. Carl was in the kitchen stringing snow pea pods for dinner when Renee came in. Can I talk to you for a minute? I know it hasn't been obvious. No, he prayed. Don't say it. Please don't. But I'm really grateful to have you here with me. The things that have been going on in my head, if it had been any normal kind of depression, I know you would have understood and we could have handled it. But what happened? It was almost as if I were a theologian proving that there was no God. Indeed, because mathematics to her represents all of order, all of reality. And now that she has discovered that that reality is false or doesn't relate, relate to reality whatsoever, her world is literally crumbling. It's a feeling I can't convey to you. It was something that I believed deeply, implicitly, and it's not true. And I'm the one who demonstrated it. He opened his mouth to say that he knew exactly what she meant, that he had felt the same things as she. But he stopped himself, for this was an empathy that separated rather than unified them. And he couldn't tell her that. What an interesting, abrupt ending. And before I stop, I think it's worth mentioning the afterword because um, I looked and was disappointed to find there is an afterword. There is a story note section at the very end. Uh, I should have gone over this, but reading this division by zero, it kind of starts to make a little bit more sense. But one of the things we admire most in fiction is an ending that is surprising yet inevitable. That is something that Sean Coyne has said quite often, who is the editor over at StoryGrid. This is also what characterizes elegance in design, the invention that's clever, yet seems totally natural. Of course, we know that they aren't really inevitable. It's human ingenuity that makes them seem that way, temporarily. Yet once you've seen the derivation, you feel that this equation really is inevitable, that this is the only way things could be. A proof that mathematics is inconsistent and that all its wondrous beauty was just an illusion would, it seemed to me, be one of the worst things you could ever learn. So an interesting ending, and I think the story notes are worth visiting, especially if you're confused like I was. I'm not a math guy, and so I just, I think I barely understand what the math was saying about the relationships. I think what I got most out of the story was seeing this crumbling relationship and seeing how her discovery, right, about how reality is just in, in, finding out that it's meaningless or that mathematics are meaningless, uh, arithmetic, and how we describe the world doesn't matter anymore. It, it's like nothing fits any longer. Whereas if you don't have that knowledge, it doesn't matter. You can, you can appreciate the beauty around you for what it is. You don't need to know the inner workings of it. And what Ted Chang is saying here about endings is clever, yet seems totally natural. Of course, we know they aren't really inevitable, right? This is human ingenuity. This, these are the patterns we are creating. This is the meaning we are ascribing to things. And that is, these, these patterns were wired for, um, um, particularly with human faces. That's why we always see faces and things, right? Because we're just wired to see them. That doesn't mean they're there. And her saying the language of, of science, right, is just meaningless. Nothing matters to her anymore. She's crumbling. Her relationship's crumbling. 
I think it was really great to put her in a mental institution because, again, I think Ted Cheng knows that people that are extremely smart are just one step away from being absolutely insane. And I think this really... And so if you enjoy this story, um, I enjoyed it okay. The end was abrupt and weird. And then once you read the story notes and you're, and you're seeing that he's making a commentary on how a story should end and then kind of subverting those tropes... I think that's what he was doing anyway, because I felt sort of just like the story had a few more sentences to go on before you'd be like, ah, and it just wasn't there. It wasn't there. It abruptly stopped. But anyway, if you like this story, highly recommend The Passenger and Stella Maris in particular from Cormac McCarthy, because it treads very, very similar grounds in science and mathematics. Story of your life, the big one. This is the big story of this collection, the one that the actual title is based on, which is funny because it's called Stories of Your Life. And I know I kept using them interchangeably. So the short story is called Story of Your Life. But the title of the collection is Stories of Your Life. I don't know what that's about. But anyway, what did you think? Was this um, as satisfying as you would have hoped? Did it live up to all of your expectations? I mentioned early on that I read this a long time ago before the film. Um, I, I think I, I, I breezed through it too quickly because I didn't come to appreciate what it was trying to do. I also think uh, having the film visually in my mind while I read this again helped immensely, with the exception of the aliens. The aliens in the story are kind of depicted in a bit cheesy fashion, and then also there's no awe. There's no, none of that awe heard to seeing the aliens for the first time that is, is so perfectly done in the film. I think that's my only complaint about this entire story. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. Uh, finally, uh, it, it almost feels like uh, as we work chronologically uh, through this series of stories, uh, Chang is <laughs> he's honing his chops. I, I should really look back because I know these stories were written in different time periods. It's not like he decided to write the short story collection all the way through. So in essence, you're kind of getting uh, a nonlinear representation of these stories. The funny thing is, I, while I was uh, reading this story today, I was thinking about recording this video and I thought, so I'm recording this video because we know that this entire story is about the perception of time and events in time, how, how like the past, present and future are all kind of the same. Very Dr. Manhattan from uh, The Watchmen. But anyway, it got me thinking that uh, so I'm recording this video in the past, but it's my present and then you're experiencing you're experiencing it in the future, my future, but your present. Hmm. Something to ponder as we dig into stories of your life. Before I move on, I'd like to give Matt Evans some, some credit because uh, he pointed out in our channel on my Discord, you should totally join it if you're not there already, so we can talk more deeply about this book. But he, uh, he pointed out a, a thematic union between a few of the stories so far. So I'll briefly talk about them before I get into this. But in one story, Tower of Babylon, up is down and down is up, essentially when you get to a certain point. Another story is about not only math, but that time is cyclical. 1a equals 9a, division by zero. And then a third is about how we view time as linear, but can be taught that time is cyclical and happening at the same time. There's a theme, which is challenging our linear perception of time and space because space is not 3D, it's 4D. And time is the fourth dimension of space. So ponder that, if you will. If you'd like to read it firsthand, join the Discord. It's completely free. Let us begin. Your father is about to ask me the question. This is the most important moment in our lives, and I want to pay attention. Note every detail. Your dad and I have just come back from an evening out. We came out onto the patio to look at the full moon. And then your dad says, do you want to make a baby? Right now, your dad and I have been married for about two years. I'd love to tell you the story of this evening. The right time to do that would be when you're ready to have children of your own and we'll never get that chance. I remember the scenario of your origin you'll suggest when you're 12. The only reason you had me was so you could get a maid you wouldn't have to pay. That's right, I'll say. 13 years ago, I knew the carpets would need vacuuming around now and having a baby seemed to be the cheapest and easiest way to get the job done. That will be in the house on Belmont Street. Your dad and I will sell the first a couple years after your arrival. Arrival? Key word there, right? By then, Nelson and I will have moved into our farmhouse and your dad will be living with what's-her-name. I know how the story ends. I think about it a lot. I also think about how it began just a few years ago when the ships appeared in orbit and artifacts appeared in meadows. 
And then I got the phone call, a request for a meeting. Such a great opening um, scene, you know, it's such a great hook. It, we already are establishing the fact that this girl, this daughter is not going to live old enough to have children. We also get to experience the fact that she is having a divorce or her family is, is being split apart. And we also get introduced to the fact that um, aliens are coming. Yes, aliens are coming. But let us move on. They made an odd couple. One wore a military uniform and a crew cut and carried an aluminum briefcase. The other one was easily identifiable as an academic. Dr. Banks, thank you for taking the time to speak with us, he said. This is Gary Donnelly, the physicist I mentioned when we spoke on the phone. You said you wanted me to listen to a recording. I presume this has something to do with these aliens? All I can offer is the recording, said Colonel Weber. Colonel Weber took a tape machine out of his briefcase and pressed play. What do you make of that? Do you have any opinion about its linguistic properties? Well, it's clear that their vocal tract is substantially different from a human vocal tract. I assume that these aliens don't look like humans? Anything. Is there anything else you can tell us? Asked Colonel Weber. They're almost certainly using sounds that the human vocal tract can't reproduce, and maybe sounds that the human ear can't distinguish. Suppose I gave you an hour's worth of recordings. How long would it take you to determine if we needed this sound spectrograph or not? I'd need to talk with the aliens directly. Not possible. The only way to learn an unknown language is to interact with a native speaker. And by that, I mean asking questions, holding a conversation, that sort of thing. Suppose we were learning a new language by talking to its speakers. Could you do it without teaching them English? They'd almost certainly pick up bits and pieces while I'm learning their language, but it wouldn't have to be much if they're willing to teach. I'll get back to you on this matter. The request for the meeting was perhaps the second most momentous phone call in my life. The first, of course, will be the one from Mountain Rescue. After I get that phone call, the first thing I'll do will be call your father. He and I will drive out together to perform the identification, a long, silent car ride. I remember the morgue, all tile and stainless steel, the hum of refrigeration and smell of antiseptic. An orderly will pull the sheet back to reveal your face. Your face will look wrong somehow, but I'll know it's you. Yes, that's her, I'll say. She's mine. You'll be 25 then. The MP checked my badge and opened the gate. I drove the off-road vehicle into the encampment. At the center of the encampment was one of the alien devices nicknamed looking glasses. The looking glasses acted as a two-way communication device, presumably with the ships in orbit. Outside the tent were three tripod-mounted video cameras whose lenses peered through windows in the fabric wall into the main room. Gary held open the tent flap and gestured for me to enter. Step right up. Marvel at the creatures, the likes of which have never been seen on God's green earth. In the looking glass, it resembled a semicircular mirror over 10 feet high and 20 feet across. So we know in the film, I guess maybe you don't know in the film, there's a crazy uh, anti-gravitational kind of thing where they get up into the ship, which was extremely cool. Unfortunately, it was omitted from this. Well, it didn't exist in this story. But as we crossed the paint line, the looking glass appeared to grow transparent. It was as if someone was slowly raising the illumination behind, the, behind tinted glass. Once the looking glass was fully lit, it resembled a life-size diorama of semicircular room. The room contained a few large objects that might have been furniture, but no aliens. I jumped when one of them entered. And that is the, <laughs> the, the limit of the awe or surprise we get from the protagonist, which is kind of strange. Like I said earlier, it's just, it's odd. I, if you're seeing aliens for the first time, I think you might be a little bit more surprised. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. It looked like a barrel suspended at the intersection of seven limbs. It was radically symmetrical, and any of its limbs could serve as an arm or a leg. Gary called them heptapods, and this is very reminiscent to me of H.P. Lovecraft's The Elder's Things. I'll try to put a screenshot up here if I remember. So I was constantly envisioning those. Actually, I tried to envision what they looked like in the film because those are way cooler. Seven lidless eyes ring the top of the heptapod's body. With eyes on all its sides, any direction might as well be forward. Sounds like foreshadowing to me. This would be my first attempt at conducting a true monolingual discovery procedure. I walked up to the looking glass and a heptapod on the other side did the same. I could see the texture of its gray skin, like corduroy ridges arranged in whorls and loops. I pointed to myself and slowly said, human. Then I pointed at each heptapod and said, what are you? One of the heptapods pointed to itself with one limb, the four terminal digits pressed together. 
I heard a brief fluttering sound and saw a puckered orifice at the top of its body vibrate. It was talking. Its screen were two virtually identical spectrographs representing the fluttering sounds. This is when we're going to get the, uh, the visual indication of the language. The heptapod fluttered some more. I pointed at something that might have been a heptapod chair. What is that? The heptapod uh, paused and then pointed at that chair and talked some more. At my computer, I delimited certain sections of the spectrograph and typed in a tentative gloss for each. Heptapod for flutter one, yes for flutter two, and chair for flutter three. Then I typed language, heptapod A, as a heading for all the utterances. Now let's try something just for laughs. I tried to mimic the sound of flutter one. She's pretty excited already, not fearful whatsoever, which is, again, kind of odd. I tried pronouncing flutter one again, but there was no reaction. Not even close, I grumbled. Now we make sure it hasn't actually been saying, aren't they cute, or look at what they're doing now. Then we see if we can identify any of these words when the other heptapod pronounces them. In 1770, Captain Cook's ship, Endeavour, ran aground on the coast of Queensland, Australia, led an exploration party, and met the Aboriginal people. The Aborigine, Aborigine, <laughs> that's how you say it, uh, replied, Kanguru, what did you say? I tell that story in my introductory course every year. It's almost certainly untrue, and I explain that afterwards. Of course, the anecdotes of my undergraduates will really want to hear are the ones featuring the heptapods. For the rest of my teaching career, that'll be the reason many of them sign up for my courses. I remember one afternoon when you are five years old, after you've come home from kindergarten. Mom, you'll say, can I ask you something? Can I be um, honored? At school, Sharon said she got to be honored. It was when her big sister got married. She said only one person could be um, honored, and she was it. Kind of painful once you know um, exactly what's going to happen. Gary and I entered the prefab building containing the center of operations for the Looking Glass site. We briefed the colonel on our first day's results. Doesn't sound like you got very far, he said. I have an idea as how we can make faster progress, I said. But you'll have to approve the use of more equipment digital camera, and a big screen. Then it occurred to me that the heptapods must have writing too. It's like picking out the letters in a printed sentence instead of trying to hear them when the sentence is, spo sentence is spoken aloud. The colonel turned to Gary. Your opinion? Sounds like a good idea to me. Their looking glasses are based on a completely different technology than our video screens. You think the scan lines on our video screens might render them unreadable to the heptapods? Request granted. I remember one day during the summer when you're 16. You'll have a friend of yours, Roxy. You may feel the urge to make comments about him, I'll say. Don't worry, Mom. We'll do it so that he won't know. Roxy, you ask me what I think the weather will be tonight, then I'll say what I think of Mom's date. No, you most definitely will not. A little later on, Nelson will arrive and pick me up. Just as we're about to leave, Roxy will say to you casually, So what do you think the weather will be like tonight? I think it's going to be really hot, <laughs> you'll answer. At our next session at the Looking Glass, we repeated the procedures we had performed before, this time displaying a printed word on our computer screen at the same time we spoke, showing human while saying human and so forth. We soon settled into a routine and I compiled two parallel corpora, one of the spoken utterances, one of the writing samples. It turned out that they had an orifice on the other side of their body lined with articulated bony ridges, probably used for eating while the other one at the top was for respiration and speech. I also tried asking our two informants for terms for addressing each individually, personal names, if they had such things. I dubbed them Flapper and Raspberry. I'll need your help with a session, I told Gary. We need to elicit some verbs, and it's easiest with third-person forms. Would you act out a few verbs while I type the written form on the computer? We began with some simple intransitive verbs, walking, jumping, speaking, writing. Gary demonstrated each. Raspberry began mimicking Gary. It looked like they had analogs of nouns and verbs. Thank goodness. In the writing, however, things weren't as clear cut. Okay, I said to Gary. Show them the food and then eat some. First the apple, then the bread. Raspberry left the room and returned with some kind of giant nut or gourd in a gelatinous ellipsoid. Then Raspberry brought the gourd down between his legs. A crunching sound resulted and the gourd reemerged minus a bite. Next, we got spoken and written names for the gelatin egg and descriptions of the act of eating it. Now I realized all of them actually did contain the logogram for heptapod. 
Some were rotated and distorted by being combined with the various verbs. Their script isn't word divided. A sentence is written by joining the logograms for the constituent words. They join the logograms by rotating and modifying them. And I think in the film, this was really, it looked awesome the way they did it. I thought it was perfect a translation from the story to, to visuals. So they can read a word with equal ease no matter how it's rotated. I wonder if it's a consequence of their body's radial symmetry. Their bodies have no forward direction. Highly neat. I couldn't believe it. I was working with somebody who modified the word neat with highly. <laughs> we can't simply cut their sentences into individual words and recombine them. We'll have to learn the rules of the script before we can write anything legible. To be fair, the heptapods were completely cooperative. In the days that followed, they readily taught us their language without requiring us to teach them any more English. It would be a while before we'd be ready to ask the heptapods why they had come or to discuss physics. For the time being, we worked on the basics. Our biggest source of confusion was the heptapods writing. It didn't appear to be writing at all. It looked more like a bunch of intricate graphic designs. This form of writing was reminiscent of primitive sign systems, which required a reader to know a message's context in order to understand it. Yet it was unlikely that the heptapods developed that their level of technology with only an oral tradition. That implied one of three possibilities. The first was that the heptapods had a true writing system. The second was that the heptapods hadn't originated the technology they were using. And the third, and most interesting to me, was that the heptapods were using a non-linear system of orthography that qualified as true writing. I remember a conversation we'll have when you're in your junior year of high school. They're not kidding when they say the body weight makes a difference. I didn't drink any more than the guys did, but I got so much drunker. You know you did the exact same things when you were my age. What I'll think is that you are clearly madding Ingley, <laughs> not me. It will remind me again that you won't be a clone of me. You can be wonderful, a daily delight, but you won't be someone I could have created by myself. The military had set up a trailer containing our offices at the Looking Glass site. It's a seismographic writing system, I said when I reached him. I went to the chalkboard and drew a circle with a diagonal line bisecting it. What does this mean? Not allowed? Next, I printed the words not allowed on the chalkboard. And so does this. But only one is a representation of speech. Linguists describe writing like this. I indicated the printed words as glottographic because it represents speech. However, this symbol, I indicated the circle and diagonal line, is semasiographic. <laughs> I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Writing. Because it conveys meaning without reference to speech. It's not picture writing. It's far more complex. It has its own system of rules for constructing sentences, like a visual syntax. It's unrelated to the syntax for their spoken language. In their spoken language, a noun has a case marker indicating whether it's a subject or an object. In their written language, however, a noun is identified as subject or object based on the orientation of its logogram relative to that of the verb. That's one thing about the story um, that you may like or dislike. There's a lot of detail about this. I think it's, it's so cool to see it all explained here, though. I, I don't think that anything Chang really explained here was something any layman like myself couldn't uh, grasp. And so on one hand, I did appreciate the detail, but on the other hand, I, I kind of wanted more story, if that makes sense. I wanted more emotional reaction to discoveries and less just the discoveries described ad nauseum. But I can understand Ted Cheng is clearly fascinated by science and he wants to communicate these ideas in a clear way. Another example is the inflection system. In their written language, the logogram means roughly hear easily or hear clearly. See the elements it has in common with the logogram for here? You can still combine it with heptapod in the same way as before to indicate that the heptapod can hear something clearly or that the heptapod is clearly heard. But what's really interesting is that the modulation of here into here clearly isn't a special case. You see the transformation they applied? It's essentially a grammar in two dimensions. Mathematical equations, notations for music and dance, but those are all very specialized. We couldn't record this conversation using them. So I take it this means we won't be able to use their writing to help us learn their spoken language. Not yet. We need a better grasp on this writing system before we begin anything else. Patience, good sir. Patience is a virtue. You'll be six when your father has a conference to attend in Hawaii and will accompany him. You'll ask me if I can carry your Etch-a-Sketch in my bag since there won't be any more room for it in yours and you simply can't leave without it. You won't need all of these. There'll be so many fun things to do there. You won't have time to play with so many toys. I want to be in Hawaii now, you'll whine. Sometimes it's good to wait, I'll say. The anticipation makes it more fun 
when you get there. See the parallelism there? Um, I've noticed I've noticed that often in, in many of these kind of cut back and forth, particularly at the end. I didn't really notice it here as much on the first read along. So I, I love revisiting this text to to notice these things a lot more closely. In the next report I submitted, I suggested that the term logogram was a misnomer because it applied that each graph represented a spoken word when in fact the graphs didn't correspond to our notion of spoken words at all. I suggested the term semigram instead. It was meaningful on its own and in combination with the other semigrams could form endless statements. When it came to sentences in Heptapod B though, things became much more confusing. The language had no written punctuation. A sentence seemed to be whatever number of semigrams a heptapod wanted to join together. When heptapod B sentence grew fairly sizable, its visual impact was remarkable. The writing looked like fanciful praying mantids drawn in a cursive style, all clinging to each other to form an, an Escher-esque lattice. That's a cool description. I remember a picture of you taken at your college graduation. I can't believe that you, a grown woman, taller than me and beautiful enough to make my heart ache, will be the same girl I used to lift off the ground so you could reach the drinking fountain. The same girl who used to trundle out of my bedroom draped in a dress and hat and four scarves from my closet. They'll do what makes you happy, and that'll be all I ask for. As time went on, the teams at each looking glass began working in earnest on learning heptapod terminology for elementary mathematics and physics. Our teams were successful with basic arithmetic, but we hit a roadblock with geometry and algebra. Likewise, the physics discussions went poorly. We tried physical demonstrations as well as line drawings, photos, and animations, but none were effective. By contrast, the linguists were having much more success. We made steady progress decoding the grammar of the spoken language. We regularly asked the heptapods why they had come, each time they answered, to see or to observe. Perhaps they were scientists, perhaps they were tourists. I remember once when we'll be driving to the mall to buy some new clothes for you. You'll be 13. You'll give me some instructions as I'm parking the car. Okay, mom, give me one of the credit cards and we can meet back in the entrance here in two hours. Not a chance. Okay, mom, okay. You can come with me. Just walk a little ways behind me so it doesn't look like we're together. Excuse me? I am not the hired help, nor am I some mutant relative for you to be ashamed of. I've already met your friends. They've been to the house. It won't have been that long since you enjoyed going shopping with me. It will forever astonish me how quickly you grow out of one phase and enter another. Living with you will be like aiming for a moving target. You'll always be further along than I expect. There's so much <laughs> great stuff, uh, subtext in, in, in that line, for instance. And then, plus, I love the fact that we have the future tense, we have the past tense, and we also have present tense a little bit later in the story. And so already, Chang has, has laid the, the foundation for the fact that uh, time, we're experiencing it, or she's experiencing it all simultaneously. I looked at the sentence in Heptapod B. Like all the sentences I generated myself, this one looked misshapen, like the heptapod written sentence that had been smashed with a hammer and then inexpertly taped back together. There was a knock at the door, and before I could answer, Gary came home looking jubilant. Illinois got a repetition in physics. It happened a few hours ago. He started erasing my blackboard. Don't worry, I didn't need any of that. Good. He picked up a nub of shock and drew a diagram. The funny thing here is... Uh, this is uh, how refraction works through water. So above we have air, below we have water. And the thing that made me laugh, and it's it's totally applicable to the story because I have a daughter, a young daughter, and she did a presentation at school about uh, how light refracts through air and water. And so this made me smile, you know, aside from the fact that this is also about a parent and a daughter. But I thought that was just, um, well, it was hilarious when I when I got to this page. Okay, here's the path of light the ray takes when crossing from air to water. The path is the fastest possible route between these two points. Imagine, just for grins, that the ray of light traveled along this path. He added a dotted line at the diagram. This hypothetical path is shorter than the path the light actually takes, but light travels more slowly in water than it does in air. So it would take longer for light to travel along this path than it does along the real path. Now imagine if light were to travel along the other path. This path reduces the percentage that's underwater, but the total length is larger. It would also take longer for a light to travel along this path than along the actual one. That's Fermat's principle of least time. And this is what the heptapods responded to? Exactly. It's neat, all right, but how come I haven't heard of Fermat's principle before? We guessed wrong about what it'd be most useful for you to know. You think the heptapod's idea of what's simple doesn't match ours? Exactly. Which is why I'm dying to see their mathematical description of Fermat's principle looks like. 
Their entire system of mathematics may be topsy-turvy compared to ours. Fermat's principle of least time is incomplete. It's more accurate to say that light always follows an extreme path, either one that minimizes the time taken or one that maximizes it. And there are more of these variational principles. In all branches of physics, almost every physical law can be restated as a variational principle. I think this is the wedge we've been looking for, the one that cracks open their formulation of physics. Hey, Louise, want to go out for dinner? My treat. Sure, I said. It'll be when you first learn to walk that I get daily demonstrations of the asymmetry in our relationship. You'll be incessantly running off somewhere. And each time you walk into a door frame or scrape your knee, the pain feels like it's my own. Interesting use of asymmetry right there. I don't know if that was a hint or not, but uh, we know that uh, the aliens seem, the heptapods seem like they are symmetrical. So I thought that was a cool little contrast. And then there will be times when I see you laughing. You'll be laughing so hard you'll start hiccuping and you'll shriek and start laughing again. It'll be the most wonderful sound I could ever imagine. A sound that makes me feel like a fountain or a wellspring. After the breakthrough with Fermat's principle, discussing of scientific concepts became more fruitful. According to Gary, the heptapod's formulation of physics was indeed topsy-turvy relative to ours. To define attributes that humans thought as fundamental, like velocity, heptapods employed mathematics that were highly weird. Still, I tried to ponder questions formulated in terms more familiar to, to me. What kind of worldview did the heptapods have? What they would consider Fermat's principle and the simplest explanation of light refraction? What kind of perception made a minimum or maximum readily apparent to them? Your eyes will be blue like your dad's, not mud brown like mine. I remember when you were 15, coming home after a weekend at your dad's, incredulous over the interrogation he'll have put you through regarding the boy you're currently dating. You know what he said? He said, I know what teenage boys are like. Don't hold that against him. He wishes I were still a kid. He hasn't known how to act toward me since I grew breasts. Give him time to recover. It's been years, Mom. How long is it going to take? I'll let you know when my father has come to terms with mine. <laughs> During one of the video conferences for the linguist, Cisneros from the Massachusetts Looking Glass had raised an interesting question. Was there a particular order in which semigrams are written in a heptapod B sentence? Was word order similarly unimportant when writing in heptapod B? As far as anyone could tell, there was no preferred order when reading the semigrams in a sentence. You could start almost anywhere in the nest. Was the same true about writing? I had asked them if, instead of displaying a semigram only after it was completed, they could show it to us while it was being written. What Flapper had said was that the heptapod's planet had two moons, one significantly larger than the other, and finally I froze the video right after the first stroke was completed and before the second one was begun, and all that was visible on screen was a single sinuous line. That meant that the heptapod had to know how the entire sentence would be laid out before it could write the very first stroke. The heptapods didn't write a sentence one semigram at a time. They built it out of strokes, irrespective of individual semigrams. Now we are starting to tease out the um, the all-knowing, how I, I thought it was really interesting and I highlighted it. Obviously, I highlight a lot of stuff while I go through this. But um, when they talk about how the heptapods know the answer because they perceive time as simultaneous, but the answer has to be spoken for it to be valid. I don't know. It's, it was a weird concept. We'll get there. There's a joke that I once heard a comedian. I didn't even know that was a word. Tell. It goes like this. I'm not sure if I'm ready to have children. I asked a friend of mine who has children. Suppose I do have kids. What if when they grow up, they blame me for everything that's wrong with their lives? She laughed and said, what do you mean if? That's my favorite joke. Of course. Gary and I were at a little Chinese restaurant. So how are you doing with your heptapod B practice? You've given up, haven't you? I thought learning heptapod B might be more like learning mathematics and trying to speak another language, but it's not. I did want to ask you about Fermat's principle. Something about it feels odd to me, but I can't put my finger on it. It just doesn't sound like a law of physics. Fermat's principle sounds weird because it describes light's behavior in goal-oriented terms. It sounds like a commandment to a light beam. Thou shalt minimize or maximize the time taken to reach thy destination. So let's say the goal of a ray of light is to take the fastest path. How does the light go about doing that? The light has to examine the possible paths and compute how long each one would take. The notion of a fastest path is meaningless unless there's a destination specified. And computing how long a given path takes also requires information about what lies along the path, like where the water surface is. And the light ray has to know all that ahead of time before it starts moving, right? The light has to do all its computations at the very beginning. The ray of light has to know where it will ultimately end up before it can choose the direction to begin moving in. 
that's another thing I love about the story is that even though he's using a lot of, you know, scientific terminology and, and principles and laws and, and all this stuff, uh, he equates it in such easy to understand terms, right? And I think a lot of the repetition, obviously the parallelism with the, with the, um, the future tense parts with, with her daughter definitely helps because it, it definitely brings it down to a more palatable narrative, something that isn't just completely littered with jargon. I remember when you're 14. Mom, what do you call it when both sides can win? There's some technical name for it, some math word. Why don't you call your dad? Can you call dad and ask him, but don't tell him it's for me? I think you can call him yourself. I'd help you with all this if I could, but I don't remember what it's called. I practiced Heptapod B at every opportunity, both with the other linguists and by myself. Over time, the sentences I wrote grew shapelier, more cohesive. Instead of carefully trying to design a sentence before writing, I could simply begin putting down strokes immediately. I was developing a faculty like that of the heptapods. More interesting was the fact that heptapod B was changing the way I thought. And this is when she's talking about someone she knew and, and how he uh, perceived language. So he grew up using American Sign Language because he was born to deaf parents. And he told me that he often thought in ASL. And now this is kind of the turning point when my thoughts were becoming graphically coded. A representative from the State Department named Hosner had the job of briefing U.S. scientists on our agenda with the heptapods. They must have had some reason for coming all this way. Are they prospectors, anthropologists, missionaries? If we handle ourselves correctly, both we and the heptapods could come out winners. You mean a non-zero-sum game? There we go. A non-zero-sum game. When both sides can win, I just remembered it's called a non-zero-sum game. I guess I knew it after all. You'll give me a sudden brief hug and your hair will smell of apples. You're the best. Hosner kept blathering. Your immediate task is to think back on what you've learned. Gee, it never occurred to us to look for things like that, I said. Bugart the linguist. They maintain that they're here to observe and they maintain that information is not tradable. Poor Hosner just still trying to dig for info. But that day when Gary first explained Fermat's principle to me, he had mentioned that almost every physical law could be stated as a variational principle. And these were conducive to a chronological causal interpretation of events. One moment growing out of the other, causes and effects creating a chain reaction that grew from past to future. In contrast, the physical attributes that the heptapods found intuitive, like action, they were meaningful only over a period of time. And by viewing the events over a period of time, a goal of minimizing and maximizing, and one had to know the initial and final states to meet that goal. Right? Crazy. Why? You'll ask again. You'll be three. Because it's your bedtime. But why? Because I'm the mom, and I said so. All those vows made in childhood that I would give reasonable answers when I became a parent, that I would treat my own child as an intelligent, thinking individual, all for naught. <laughs> exactly. That, I think that's what makes this story so great as well, is that Ted Chang, he's doing this in all of these stories pretty much, but this one is the most successful to me because he finally created a, an incredibly meaningful relationship between people, right? The mother and the daughter, uh, something that anyone can identify with who has children. If you don't have children out there, and if you do have children someday, I urge you to uh, come back and read this story because it will have a very different meaning to you. Uh, it will be uh, much heavier, let's say. Was it actually possible to know the future? Gary once told me that the fundamental laws of physics were time symmetric, that there was no physical difference between, between past and future. I like to imagine the objection as a Borgesian fabulation. <laughs> say that three times fast. Standing before the book of ages, and she flips through the tissue thin leaves until she locates the story of her life. The story of her life. She finds the passage that describes her flipping through the book of ages, and later in the day, acting on information she's read in the book, she now resolves to refrain from betting on the ponies altogether because of the information she received. But that's the rub. The book of ages cannot be wrong. This scenario is based on the premise that the person is given knowledge of the actual future, not of some possible future. The result is a contradiction. The book of ages must be right by definition. Yet, no matter what the book of ages says she'll do, she can choose to do otherwise. How can these two facts be reconciled? The existence of free will meant that we couldn't know the future. What if the experience of knowing the future changed a person? Interesting. I stopped by Gary's office before leaving for the day. I'm calling it quits. Did you want to grab something to eat? Hey, want to come to my place for tonight? I'll cook. Great. We just need to go shopping for some ingredients. When you are three, you'll pull a dish towel off the kitchen counter and bring that salad bowl down on top of you. The edge of the bowl will leave you with a cut. I reached out and took the bowl from the shelf. 
The motion didn't feel like something I was forced to do. Instead, it seemed just as urgent as my rushing to catch the bull when it falls on you, an instinct that I felt right all along. So this is when she's at Gary's place catching the bull and the uh, present, past, and future are all kind of merging and she's finally starting to grasp what this feels like. And I have no idea what that might feel like. I feel like it would be maddening, especially if we evolved as a species to think in a linear fashion. Consider this sentence, the rabbit is ready to eat. Interpret a rabbit to be the subject of eat, and it was a hint such as a young girl might give her mother, so she'll open a bag of Purina bunny chow. Only context could determine what the sentence meant. Consider the phenomenon of light hitting water at one angle. A difference in the index of refraction caused the light to change direction, and one saw the world as a human saw it. Explain it by saying the light minimized the time needed to travel to its destination, and one saw the world as the heptapods saw it. One causal and the other teleological. So now it's all explained for us. Humans had developed a sequential mode of awareness, while heptapods had developed a simultaneous mode of awareness. They experienced all events at once, a minimizing, maximizing purpose. And that's the funny thing about the story uh, is that I don't know what that, I have no idea what that would be like to experience everything simultaneously. Like I said, just a couple minutes ago, I feel like it would drive somebody insane to, to, to have that ability. I have a recurring dream about your death. You're three years old riding in some kind of backpack I'm wearing while she's rock climbing. You start pulling yourself out of the pack. You slide right past me and I can't move a muscle. Then all of a sudden I'm at the morgue An orderly lifts the sheet from your face and I see that you're 25. I was sitting upright in bed. I'd woken Gary with my movements. So again, more of that simultaneous experience. When you're three and we're climbing a steep spiral flight of stairs, I hold your hand extra tightly. I can do it by myself, you'll insist. I finished the last radical in the sentence and surveyed the giant heptapod B sentence I'd written that covered the entire blackboard in my office. I understood why the heptapods had evolved a semasiographic writing system like heptapod B. For them, speech was a bottleneck because it required that one word follow another sequentially. I can see that how, how that would be a bottleneck, especially coming from that perspective. With writing, on the other hand, every mark on a page was visible simultaneously. I remember when you'll be a month old and I'll stumble out of bed to give you a 2 a.m. feeding. The word infant is derived from the Latin word for unable to speak, but you'll be perfectly capable of saying one thing, I suffer, and you'll do it tirelessly, without hesitation. So it's interesting there, she's noting that before we have language, we can communicate. At the stage of your life, there'll be no past or future for you. Once you begin nursing, everything will reverse and all will be right with the world. Now is the only moment you'll perceive. You'll live in the present tense. I love that because, you know, when we're children and we don't necessarily understand the concept of past, present, and future, she describes it so well here um, from the, the mind of a child, which essentially at this point in time, she is the infant, right? She is the infant learning this language, and so all of it is, is foreign to her. However, she is, she is beginning to grasp it. The heptopods are neither free nor bound as we understand those concepts. They don't act according to their will, nor are they helpless automatons. They act to create the future, to enact chronology. Within the context of simultaneous consciousness, freedom is not meaningful, but neither is coercion. It's simply a different context. Either an elegant young woman face turned away from the viewer or a wart nose crown. I found this image, so I'll throw it up here if I remember. Similarly, knowledge of the future was incompatible with free will. Of course it is. I turned on the VCR and slotted a cassette of a session from the Fort Worth Looking Glass. A diplomatic negotiator was having a discussion with heptopods there. The negotiator was describing humans' moral beliefs. If the heptopods already knew everything, that they would ever say or hear, what was the point of their using language at all? A reasonable question. According to speech act theory, statements like, you're under arrest, I christen the ve this vessel, or I promise, were all performative. A speaker could perform the action only by uttering the words. I now pronounce you husband and wife, but until the minister actually said them, the ceremony did not count. With performative language, saying equal doing. Instead of using language to inform they use language to actualize. So that's what I was talking about earlier, how it's it's like they already know the answer, but like it seals the deal, I guess. It's it's kind of a weird thing to, to wrap your mind around. The first Goldilocks tried the Papa Bear's bowl of porridge, but it was full of Brussels sprouts, which she hated. You'll laugh. No, that's wrong. You have to read it the right way. That's not how the story goes. Well, if you already know how the story goes, why do you need me to read it to you? Because I want to hear it. Oh, such a beautiful 
example of of what he just explained, right? This is such a great example of how we can internalize this stuff. And I don't know, the more I go through this book, he he's giving us concepts, he's reinforcing those concepts with, you know, scientific jargon in, in, to, to, in, to, in such a way where you can understand it, but then he like really hammers it home with these emotional interactions uh, with with a, with a mother and daughter, or even or even Gary, and it's almost as if he's using these two different methods of of communication, which is something I'm just picking up right now for some reason. But in in one way, we're given uh, just the, the information right as it is. He's explaining it carefully and clearly, but then he hits us with emotional communication, very similarly to how the infant communicates with the mother. So mind blown again. Good job, Chang. Good, jo- good, good job, Chang. A- anything I've said bad about you so far, I was wrong. The air conditioning of Weber's office almost compensated for having to talk about this man. They're willing to engage in a type of exchange. We simply give them something and they give us something in return. Neither party tells the other what they're giving beforehand. We don't know if this transaction has the same associations for the heptopause that gift giving has for us. Can we, he searched for the right wording, drop hints about what kind of gifts we want? I doubt it, given that's not a custom they engage in. Have you discovered anything new in the physics discussions? If you mean any information new to mankind, no, said Gary. Maybe we can arrange some kind of gift-giving ceremony? With her causal and teleological interpretations, every linguistic event had two possible interpretations, a transmission of information as the and as the realization of a plan. There it is, reinforced yet again. Even though I'm proficient with heptopod B, I know I don't experience reality the way the heptopod does. My mind was cast in the mold of a human, (laughs) which is probably why I'm really having a difficult time comprehending what it's like to experience the past, present, and future at the same time. After I learned heptopod B, new memories fell into place like gigantic blocks, each one measuring years in duration. And though they didn't arrive in order or land contiguously, They soon composed a period of five decades. Usually heptopod B affects just my memory. My consciousness crawls along as it did before. The difference being that the ash of memory lies ahead as well as behind. I perceive during those glimpses that entire epoch as simultaneity. It's a period encompassing the rest of my life and the entirety of yours. Shit. Crazy. This was the second gift exchange I had been present for. For the eighth one overall, and I knew it would be the last, the looking glass tent was crowded with people. In a previous exchange, the heptopods had given us information about ourselves that we had previously told them. This had infuriated the State Department. That looks like inorganic chemistry, said the nuclear physicist. <laughs> Sorry, that's a, that's a nuclear physicist voice. Maybe we're finally getting somewhere. I want to see more animal pictures, I whispered. I didn't want the heptopods to give us new technology because I didn't want to see what our governments might do with it course. After a minute, the heptopod screen went blank, and a minute after that, ours did too. Colonel Weber turned. Schedule the time and location for the next exchange. Weber wants more, man. I wrote the semigrams for locus exchange transaction converse inclusive we with a projective aspect modulation. Woo! That was a, uh, a brain fall. Raspberry wrote its reply. What's going on? Where did it go? It said that the heptopods are leaving now. Not just itself, all of them. Call it back here now. Ask what it means. The image of the room in the looking glass disappeared. I think, Gary said, we just saw a demonstration of transmutation at distance. I remember what it'll be like watching you when you're a day old. It will seem incongruously tiny, given how enormous I felt during the pregnancy. And while poking out your legs one at a time, I'll recognize the gesture as one I had felt you do inside me many times. So that's what it looks like. That final gift exchange was the last we ever saw of the heptopods. All at once, all over the world, their looking glasses became transparent and their ships left orbit. We never did learn why the heptopods left any more than we learned what brought them here. Working with heptopods changed my life. I met your father and learned heptopod B, both of which make it possible for me to know you now here on the patio in the moonlight. I'm working toward an extreme of joy or of pain. Will I achieve a minimum or a maximum? These questions are in my mind when your father asks me, do you want to make a baby? And I smile and answer, yes. And I unwrap his arms from around me and we hold hands as we walk inside to make love, to make you. Man. Whew, I need a minute. That was, um, that was heavy. That was great. That was fantastic. That was an amazing, amazing short story. Um, 
I, I think I may like the ending of this better than I do um, the film because the film starts to kind of wrap s this not political plot line, but something to demonstrate this past, present, future information language. Whereas this kept everything small, the heptapods leave, and uh, the gift was that they bestowed this gift to her, this this gift of language, or a curse, you might argue. But really this last bit here, to me, means she knows her daughter is going to die at 25, I believe. And um, she knows all of this and is experiencing all of this simultaneously, her, her, her birth, her death, and she knows she's going to have to relive this. But at the very end, we come full circle. He asks if she wants to make a baby, and she says yes, because it's worth it. All of the pain, all of the struggle is totally worth it, even though she knows her daughter is going to die and not live a full life. Beautiful, beautiful. This is why I read, folks. This is why I love fiction. Uh, thank you, Ted Chang, for that. I think this was a... Uh, a story that I guess I wasn't ready for the first time. I was kind of reading it for the wrong reasons. I just wanted to read it to get a, uh, to grasp the story before I went and saw the film. Um, but now I'm glad I got to read it slowly, uh, carefully, also along with everybody out there. So thanks for joining me. But I should talk about the, uh, the afterward, right? I'll just read it really quick. I didn't even read this yet, but story of your life. The story grew out of my interest in the variational principle of physics. I found these principles fascinating ever since I first learned of them, but I didn't know how to use them in a story until I saw a performance of The Time Flies When You're Alive. Paul Link's one-man show about his wife's battle with breast cancer. Okay. It occurred to me then that I might be able to use the variational principle to tell a story about a person's response to the inevitable, the death of the daughter. A few years, a few years later, that notion combined with a friend's remark about her newborn baby to form the nucleus of the story. For those interested in physics, I should note that their story's discussion of Fermat's principle of least time omits all mention of its quantum mechanical underpinnings. Thank you. <laughs> I had enough science for this one. The, the, the QM formulation of, is interesting in its own way, but I preferred the metaphoric possibilities of the classical version. As for the story's theme, probably the most concise summation of it is I've seen it appears in Kurt Vonnegut's introduction to the 25th anniversary edition of Slaughterhouse Five. Stephen Hawking found it tantalizing that we could not remember the future, but remembering the future is a ch is child's play for me now. I know what will become of my helpless, trusting babies because they are grown-ups now. I know how my closest friends will end up because so many of them are retired and dead now. To Stephen Hawking and to all the others younger than myself, I say... Be patient. Your future will come to you and lie down at your feet like a dog who knows and loves you no matter what you are. What a beautiful way to end this video. Hopefully you made it this far. Uh, hopefully you're enjoying the story as much as I am. Well, this this collection as much as I am. I, I think this was really the turning point for me, honestly. I, I enjoyed the last one. I enjoyed this one probably quite a bit more than any other story in here. But let me know what you're thinking. Did this one hit you as hard as it hit me? I don't think the remaining stories are going to be quite as powerful. I mean, this one was named, uh, used to name the collection, so it's pretty obvious. But anyway, I will stop. I will stop. This video is going to be so goddamn long. But thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks for, uh, thanks for watching and reading with me. It's, it's been a blast, and I, I, I love doing this. So hopefully you enjoy it too. And I will see you in the next one with the next two stories.